Would you open up to the 8th chapter of Deuteronomy once again, Deuteronomy chapter 8. And we're on this series called Possessing Your Promised Land. For those of you that aren't familiar, there's a story in the Old Testament about how God's people, what what is called, uh, among other things, the children of Israel, God's people, the children of Israel, they ended up in Egypt. And the Egyptians, because Israel began to multiply, they began to have lots of children. And over time, they multiplied to likely two to three million people. And the Egyptians began to be intimidated by them, by their growth and such. And they ended up making slaves of them. And they put them under harsh affliction and bondage. But the problem was these people had a covenant with God through Abraham, their ancestor. And so they began to cry out to the God of Abraham and God being faithful to his covenant. He called Moses and told Moses to go to Egypt and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Pharaoh said no. And after 10 horrible plagues that really decimated Egypt, God delivered his people out of Egypt, brought them out into the wilderness to bring them into the promised land that we know today as Israel is actually uh, larger than Israel is today. But he brought them across the Jordan River. Uh, That was his intention to bring them there. Well, but that first generation that came out, they had attitude. They had they were complainers. They didn't believe God. They didn't trust God. They complained about all the inconveniences in the wilderness. How many of you know there's always something to complain about? Huh? How many of you know that? Tell the person next to you, just sitting next to you. (laughs) There's always, there's always something to complain about. Isn't that right? You could complain about anything. In the kingdom of God. Go ahead. Tell them. Just joking. Come on. Tell them. I'm joking. Okay. We can complain about anything. Well, these guys were complainers. And so any inconvenience in the wilderness or any time they got a little afraid, oh, why did God bring us out here in the wilderness to kill us and such? Well, so what happened was after 10 times of them saying they should have never trusted God and Moses, finally God said, you know what? I promised I would bring you into the promised land. I promised Abraham I'd bring his descendants in, but I'm not taking you in. This is the 10th time you've done this to me, but I'll take your children in. And so... But still, here's how good God is. He fed them for 40 years until they died. He protected them for 40 years until they died. He didn't kill them. He protected them. He fed them with manna miracles every day to take care of them. Why? Because they're still the children of Israel. He still has a covenant with them. And that's the way God is with us. He wants to give all his promises to you. He wants to bless you big. But if you won't obey big then you don't get blessed big. If you obey little, you get blessed little. And so that first generation did not go into the promised land. But the second generation, God did take into the promised land. This story is the most repeated story in the Bible. And it's because this story is the explanation of salvation in Christ. That all of us found ourselves bound in sin and slaves of sin like the children of Israel were in Egypt. But when we hear the gospel and cry out to God saying, I heard that there was a God who sent his son to pay for our sins so that we could have eternal life and be helped. When we call out to God, then he comes and delivers us from the slavery of sin, forgives us completely and brings us out to bring us into the promised land. What is the promised land? Well, ultimately, it's all the promises in the Bible. God wants all these promises to come to pass for us. But there's resistance. There are demonic spirits, Satan, and other issues in life that try to stop us from taking the land that God has for us. But God wants us to have it. So we've been on this series called Possessing Your Promised Land. So let's read now. I lost my place here in Deuteronomy chapter 8. Let's look in Deuteronomy chapter 8 and let's all read verse 1. 
Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1. I'm going to read from the New King James Version. If you don't have that particular version, that's all right. But follow along on the screens, if you would, so we can all read the same words. Deuteronomy 8, verse 1, reading loudly and together, let's read. Every commandment which I command you today, you must be careful to observe that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers. So let me just explain something to you quickly. And then maybe I'll read that again. Many people who, if I can use a modern term, identify as Christians really don't understand the gospel, really don't understand the deal that Jesus has offered. See, all of us were born in sin and then we continued sinning in our lives and we're slaves of sin. In other words, we can't just stop sinning. We can stop certain sins, but then boom, other ones come out. You, we, we don't have the ability to just deliver ourselves from Egypt. Sin. We don't have that. And not only that, but if you die physically in a spiritual state of sin, you will be separated from God forever and ever, and there's only one alternative to heaven. And that's the place that God created for Satan and his demonic spirits at the end of the age to torment them forever. Satan wants everybody to go there with him. God wants nobody to go there. So what did God do? God so loved the world that God gave up his only son. How many of you know it's easier to die for somebody than to, to give your son to die for somebody? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and Jesus willingly came and made this exchange with us. He said, I'll take your sinful life that's on its way to eternal torment and I'll die with that sin and pay the price. I have no sin, so I can make the exchange. I'll die with your life of sin if you'll live with my righteous life. That's the exchange. So the problem is a lot of people today are wanting to accept the forgiveness and the eternal life, but keep their life of sin. In other words, I still get to choose how I want to live my life. That's a misunderstanding. If you're really saved, your life is dead. You have no life. The life that you're now living is the life that Jesus has given you. And the exchange is, I'm him on the earth. He's saying, I'll be you and die with your sin. You be me and live with my purpose on the earth. Amen. That's the exchange. And if that's not the exchange you made, then you misunderstood the deal. Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. Notice, not just he's been crucified. No, no, I was. If that wasn't me on the cross, then my sin was not paid for. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but not I. But Christ lives in me. Amen. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There is the exchange. So, we can't be among those who are going to be shocked at the end, surprised. Jesus said, in Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who calls me Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father in heaven. Amen. Somebody said, I thought we're not saved by works. We're saved by grace. We are saved by grace. But when you're really saved and you made the exchange and you let Jesus pay for all of your sin for you and you took his life, now, your life should show that you really believed you were saved by grace. Amen. And if your life does not show that, then it shows that you really didn't make that exchange and you really didn't let your life die, that you're still living your own life, doing your own thing. You're the God of your life still. See, so we are saved by grace, but having been saved by grace, we're supposed to be saved now. Amen. Amen. 
See, I just want everybody to understand because this is not clear everywhere. Not all believers understand this, but this is the Bible. So I want you to listen to this verse one more time in light of this. Every commandment which I command you today, you must be careful to observe that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers. To us, the land that we possess is the fulfillment of what God has called us to do in our lives. What has God called me to do? I have to possess that land. I have to fulfill my calling. And somebody said, well, it's all the blessings and the promises. It includes the blessings and the promises. But the blessings and the promises are sort of like the icing on the cake. But I have to do the will of God in my life. I can't just say, my life's just all about getting blessed. I just want money. And I want fun. And I want stuff. And I want peace. I just want the stuff that makes me feel good. No. See, God wants you to experience the joy of being like him. Jesus said this. He said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. When you're a child, you look forward to Christmas because of all the gifts you get. But as you grow older, when you start to mature, there's a transition. And now you start looking more forward to giving than getting and realizing, oh, man, I enjoy giving more. I enjoy people opening things, receiving things from me and loving it that I gave than I do them giving to me. Come on. How many of you know that's maturity? That's God. That's the way he is. He's very mature. For God so loved the world that he told them to give him something. No. No. For God so loved the world that he gave. And so God knows if your life is just about blessing, how am I going to get blessed? How am I going to get blessed? You're a child in the faith. The mature ones in the faith are the ones that are saying, Lord, how do I help you reach the people? Who are hurting. Can you see that? And this is what the Lord is speaking to us. He's helping us to possess the real land. That God is after. And the real land God is after are the people. Amen. So are there blessings that go along with this? Yes. Thank God for those blessings. But. A hundred thousand years from now. When all of us, hopefully all of us will be in heaven because we understood the gospel and made the exchange. A hundred thousand years from now, we won't care about what car we drove. Is that right? Or whether it had heated seats, cooled seats and all that. We, we will not give a rip about all of that. What we will be excited about is any sacrifice we made for a human being to be saved. For eternity. Amen. And maturity can think like that. And this is what the Lord is leading us toward and continues to reiterate to us. I, I need you to get this land. I need you to occupy the land, your neighborhood, your workplace, the people around you that are bound. They're under the deception of the enemy. And I need you to realize I've got you there. And I want to show you and lead you how to take this land. Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you become fishers of men. And so he's asking us to follow him, even getting into groups and working and discussing things. So he's leading us somewhere. And where he's leading us is to the place where we really want to be, even if we don't realize it. OK, so let me read a little introduction to you. Every believer on earth has a call of God on their life and no one can fulfill it without a fight. And it's not an easy fight either. Jesus showed us that we have to give up everything we've got. And that's what he did. His fight included fighting the devil, enduring attacks from the religious elite, the myriad of opinions of society about him, the dullness of his own disciples' hearts, and his own flesh that was tempted to not sacrifice day after day after day and ultimately at the end so that people could be saved 
so that he didn't have to be inconvenienced. The Bible says he was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. In other words, he didn't choose himself. He just kept choosing other people again and again and again, even to the very end. Thankfully, he understood that if he didn't fight to fulfill his calling, the entire world would be lost for eternity, including us. And he literally fought to the death. And now it's our turn. Jesus has called every one of us to fight for the salvation of people around us. If you listen to others, you'll think the goal of life is to accumulate a big nest egg, retire comfortably, put yourself in a position to survive shortages while others suffer, or just to eat right and exercise so that you could live a long life. So let me ask you, what if your plan works? Then what? Once you live the perfect life and die, and presuming that you go to heaven... What will you, how will you explain your life in heaven? How, you, how will you explain it to the Apostle Paul who was repeatedly tortured for taking the gospel to one city after another before being beheaded by Nero? How will you explain it to Peter and Andrew, both of whom were crucified for preaching the gospel? Or how will you explain it to Barnabas who was stoned to death? Or to John's brother James whom Herod killed with the sword in Acts 12? Or to Jesus' oldest brother, James, the leader of the Jerusalem church, whom the scribes and the Pharisees threw off the high temple wall in, down into the Kidron Valley to his death? Or how about another one of Jesus' disciples, Simon the Zealot, who after preaching the gospel to Egypt, went north and preached in Persia, modern-day Iran, and he was sawn in two? Or how about to John, the apostle, who was thrown into a cauldron of boiling oil? because he wouldn't stop preaching the gospel. And let's not even talk about what we'd say to Jesus himself, who made the ultimate sacrifice. Do you see the point? The point is that here on earth, we don't always see the reality. But Jesus understood the reality. His apostles understood the reality. And so many others in history have understood the reality and gave their lives for the most important cause and now it's our turn. The baton is being passed. Right now, today, in our day and age, in other places in the world, people's lives are on the line. People are losing their lives. They're losing their families. All kinds of persecution is happening. For us, it's a lot of embarrassment right now. We're, we're, the persecution is embarrassment. Some people may lose their jobs and things, but the persecution is relatively light compared to other places on earth. If you're like me, a conversation like this causes a paradigm shift or maybe a paradigm shift again. And let me assure you, this is an important paradigm shift for all of us. We have to come to the reality that Jesus wants to save the world. And he's trying to get the attention of his church to follow him so that he can make them fishers of men. Right now in America, the church has lost tremendous ground in recent decades tremendous ground and it's still sliding and i'm not just talking about church attendance that's been sliding too pre-covid it was sliding it dropped off the cliff and is trying to make somewhat of a comeback but is far from where it was pre-covid but it was already in a slide but not just church attendance because church attendance does not equate to people who were actually saved People who identify as Christian is also in a free fall in America and has been for several decades. The point is that the church in America is not fulfilling the Great Commission at this point in history of making disciples of this nation, much less others. And Jesus is calling for the church to follow him and not to follow the business as usual approach. And this is why, thank the Lord, that the Lord's got our attention. And he's saying, I need you to follow me. I need you to listen to me. I'm walking you through the word once again and showing you what I need you to do. Things must be turned around and soon. Not for us who are saved, but for those who are not. And this is why God is pushing us to fight for our promised land. 
the land that God's really after are the people who don't know Jesus yet. That's the most important land. Not my new car, not my bigger house. Those, God promises blessings too. But the most important thing are these people. And so I want to talk to you in the few minutes that we have left today about, and here's the title, it's kind of cutesy, so it, it doesn't really match up to the level of importance, but we have to fight the ites. We have to fight the ites. And what do we mean by that? When God brought the children of Israel into the land of Canaan, there were the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jezurites and the, Hiva, uh, the Hittites and the uh, Jebusites and the Termites. No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> there are all kind of ites in there. And every one of those ites were a people group. They were a nation. And God said, you need to drive all those nations out because I've given this land to you. They refuse to serve me, so we're going to drive them out. Now, that does, that's not what it means for us today. Somebody says, yeah, those guys that live in that nice house, we're going to kick them out of their house and take their house. That's not what we're talking about, Jack. Don't you, that, we're not wrestling with flesh and blood. This is not a war against people. Actually, the reason why we're going to sacrifice is to help those folks, even if they don't realize we're helping them. We want to help them to come to know the love of God and the salvation through Jesus. But to do that, we're going to have to confront spiritual ites, the demonic realm. But the ites that God wants to talk to us about today are some other ites that we often don't address. So let me read some scripture to you. Numbers 33. I'm going to begin at verse 53. Numbers 33, 53. And here's what God says to them. You shall dispossess the inhabitants of the land. That means, let's just say, you're going to kick them out. That's different than what we're doing we're going to kick out the demonic spirits, the satanic things, okay? But he said, you shall dispossess the inhabitants of the land and dwell in it, for I have given you the land to possess. And you shall divide the land by lot as an inheritance among your families. To the larger you shall give a larger inheritance, and to the smaller you shall give a smaller inheritance. There everyone's inheritance shall be whatever falls to him by lot. You shall inherit according to the tribes of your fathers. So let me just uh, apply that today. You will have a land and a territory that is a different size than mine, maybe a different location than mine. Maybe God targets, uh, has you to target, target, that's probably not a good term. There's so much violence going on today. We don't want anybody to misunderstand that we're talking about violence. We're not talking about violence. We're, we're coming with love. Okay? We have to fight certain spirits and certain things in ourselves, mostly and spirits out there, but we're coming with love. But God may commission you to reach a certain subculture, a certain grouping of people. They may speak a certain language. They may live in a certain neighborhood. They may work at a certain company, etc. And the Lord will show you what that is. Let's, we don't compare between one another as to wh who's got the better territory. We just do our assignment. I do my assignment. You do your assignment. Nobody's is better. Nobody's is worse. It's just the assignment the Lord has given us. And so some are smaller, some are larger. It's, it's not important as long as we're each doing what we need to do. Verse 55. But if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall be that those whom you let remain shall be irritants in your eyes and thorns in your side. And they shall harass you. Uh, in the land where you dwell. Moreover, it shall be that I will do to you as I thought to do to them. Let me read that again. Moreover, it shall be that I will do to you as I thought to do to them. I'm judging them because of their wickedness. But if you don't go do what I'm telling you to do to possess this land, then I will want to do the same thing to you because of your wickedness of rebellion. Can you see that possessing the land is not optional to God? Yep. Why? Because lives are on the line. Yep. This is a big deal. This is not about if you get around to it, yep. if it fits in your schedule, yep. if it's what you like to do. This is the Lord our God who said, we made the exchange, right? Yep. So this is what the plan is. This is what you do. And all the people who treat it as if it's an option now 
and I will decide if I obey what you're asking me to do. And see, God, God has a different view on that. Like, well, then, then we have a misunderstanding about who the Lord is then. If I was not a pastor, I'd want to be in a church like this. And there are others. Thank God for others as well. But I'd want to be in a church like this that told me the truth about what being saved is all about. Hallelujah. However, however, I could just imagine somebody that just came for Father's Day thinking, I just came for Father's Day. I'm <laughs> going to throw all this up. You're welcome. Happy Father's Day. <laughs> but think about this. The Father yep. sent a father to tell you father something so that you can live the life that you really want to live if it was easy everybody would do it possessing the land if it was easy if fulfilling the plan of God for your life was easy everybody would do it it's not easy but we can do it and God's with us all right, so what happened? Listen to Joshua 13, 13. Nevertheless, the children of Israel did not drive out the Geshurites or the Maacathites, but the Geshurites and the Maacathites dwell among the children of Israel until this day, talking about the day that this was written. So here's some of the children of Israel. They didn't do it. So did, did Israel, that second generation, conquer the land? They did, generally speaking, but he's saying, but there were places where they didn't, they didn't keep fighting until it was all conquered. And listen to Joshua 16, 10. And they did not drive out the Canaanites who dwelt in Gezer. That, that's obviously where the older folks were living. Uh, but the Canaanites dwelt among the Ephraimites to this day and have become forced slavers. Excuse me. And then just somebody said, that's wrong. <laughs> that's wrong. I didn't write the Bible. It's just... Okay, Judges 121. But the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who inhabited Jerusalem. Now, it wasn't called Jerusalem then. It was just this place out there with, that only has one spring. It's not a real desirable place. And it's kind of up a cliff here. The old city of David is where it ended up being. But this was the Jebusites up there. It was just difficult to attack. And it's like, who wants it anyway? But God said, drive them out. Amen. But they didn't. They left them there. Who did it? Benjamin. Now, if you keep reading the book of Judges, you'll find out that there, are, there were some people in Benjamin that became so wicked, especially in the area of Gibeon and such, and they got into sexual immorality. They got into homosexual immorality and such so badly that eventually all the other tribes of Israel came and attacked them and, and almost wiped the tribe of Benjamin out. And this is what God warned them about. If you leave the ites there, they will influence you to become like them. And that's why there has to be no compromise in our lives. Okay, so... So let's talk about the ice that God wants to deal with. We know we have to fight spiritual warfare against Satan, against the demonic realm and all of that. That's absolutely true. But let's talk about some of the things we have to fight in our own lives. For example, one of the ites that are hard to drive out is routine ites. We've got our routines that we're comfortable with. And we're used to these. But God has called us to press forward to reach people. But that goes against our routine that we're comfortable with. So if you leave the routineites in your life, then you cannot possess the life that God has for you. Another set of ites is the relaxites. I like to relax. So, you know, I got my routine. When I'm done with my work, I want to relax. And I don't want to add anything to my schedule. So I know, you know, you guys are doing all these groups and everything. But, you know, I don't I got the relaxites over here. But as long as I leave the relaxites in my territory, then I don't have the land occupied so that Jesus can use my territory. I'm leaving things in because I just kind of don't want to fight that. I like it. 
I like it. Another set of ites is the entertainmentites. Why? I got my TV shows, movies, social media, screen time. I, I, you know, we like to go out and do this and that and the other, so we just don't have time. And what are we saying? I don't have time to live my life with what the Lord is asking me to do. I already have my life. And Jesus is saying, I thought that life died. I thought I died with your life and you're living my life now. See, and so we've got the entertainmentites occupying our time. And we need to defeat the entertainmentites and say, look, this land belongs to Jesus. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 168 hours a, a month or a week, 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 168 hours, hours a week belong to Jesus. Right? Amen? Amen. So the first thing is I got to make sure I'm doing what he wants me to do. How about the comfortites? I'm just not comfortable being in groups. I, it's just not me. Oh, great. Well, let's just do what's comfortable for you. See, that's not lordship. Lordship is I don't decide. Aren't you glad Jesus didn't do what was comfortable for him? Yep. You ever had a bad bed to lay in? How about a cross to hang on? Comfort is not part of the assignment. Now, does God want to help with some comfort things while we're on assignment? Yes. But when it comes down to comfort or obedience... What do we choose? Obedience. Should, could have been louder. Obedience. When it comes down to comfort or obedience, what do we choose? Obedience. We choose obedience. But those comfortites will occupy our land if we don't watch it. I want to show you a short video. We're coming to a close here. Testimony of a dear lady in our, uh, in our church here. And some of what, how she's processing what the Lord is calling us to and how she's responding to that in obedience. But I want you to watch this and I'll make a couple of comments. Let's watch it. So uh, I hadn't wanted to start a Jesus church in the beginning. I just wanted to be part of a Jesus church. And um, when I attended the first Jesus church, um, the other person in the group, we met at a park. She brought table, she brought chairs, she brought snacks and at that minute I realized, oh my gosh, here I have a home and it's comfortable and here she's doing the sacrifice and being the hostess of the mostess for our group. And so I realized at that point that my sacrifice started in that minute, but it was for the good of the group, but moreover the changes and the development that were happening in our lives collectively. Um, the little that I have, my little home, my space, uh, it can be sacrificed. And so I decided, okay, um, we're going to lead it collaboratively, but, um, but at the same time, my space can be shared in order to bless others. Um, we begin to build fellowship with each other, um, encourage each other, um, really go through the, the reading um, together and um, in doing that there was partnership that started we found how we can not only strengthen each other but um, it was a safety zone I love the fact that we all felt commissioned to sacrifice our schedules to put time aside and in partnership uh, be part of this greater movement um, and I believe that we all individually were challenged to come together and um, know that what we're doing, how it's going to impact our neighborhoods, our families, our work lives, um, our friendships, um, and more than anything, to grow spiritually. And our world needs what's happening in Jesus Church. And we need to be able to feel that personal commission to be able to go out 
and um, take those small steps to take the teachings and um, the things that get tucked in our hearts and to be able to share them in whatever way that looks like that I do have like Jeremiah 29 11 I have a hope and a future and a purpose in life um, and part of that purpose is being part of Jesus Church and to be commissioned to go out and preach the gospel. Boy, you know, I, I, see, I see at least two heroes here. One is this lady that apparently didn't feel like she had a home or anything to meet in, but she defeated the ites of pride or whatever and went and got tables and chairs and snacks and in a park because the Lord's saying, do it. So she did it. That's not easy to do. You've got to fight some ites. That's not comfortable. It's not convenient. The convenient ites is out. Is that right? So that, there's one of the heroes right there. But then to have Patricia so humbly say, ah, and just to say, well, I wrestled with that. Do, do I really want to do something in my home or whatever? And, and of course, not everybody has to do it in their home. If we all did it in our homes, we'd all do it alone. Right? Because nobody else would be coming. No, but she wrestled with that and decided, oh man, here's somebody that's doing it without and I have a home, I, I can do it. And I just see some heroes here. I see some heroes here. I tell you, another ite we have to defeat is the prideites. And you know, it's easy for all of us to say, well, I'm not walking in pride. A lot of times when we say that, though, we are. And that's the reason we're saying it is because we have a hint that we are and we just don't want anybody else to know that we might be. But the prideites, for example, well, I, I don't have a home that's, you know, updated and very large or furnished well like other people do. And ah, I just kind of don't want people to come over. And that's just reality. How I many of you know most people don't? That's just reality. But there's something that if we don't watch it, we'll let that stop us from doing what the Lord's telling us to do. And that's an ite that needs to be driven out. And we need to just say, hey, look, I wish I had something better, but this is what I have. But I want to use what I have for the Lord if he wants me to. Is that right? Amen. See, there's just, there are just so many ites that we have to fight. Anything that stops us from doing what Jesus has called us to do is an ite that needs to be defeated. And so I just want to say again, I encourage all of you to step in. This is our time. Amen. Somebody said, well, it's not, a, it's not the perfect time. It's not the best time. In fact, I think it's the worst time. No. Okay, but here's, the, here's what maturity is a return to reality. Amen. And the reality is this is the time. Amen. This is the time the Lord's telling us to do it. So good, bad, those who feel like it's the worst time, well, you're going to be more blessed by the Lord because it's more sacrificial for you than somebody else. But nonetheless, this is when the Lord is calling us to do it. And Jesus made a promise to us, if you'll seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, the kingdom of God will start working for you and all the things that you need will be added to you. Because there are some other things like the debtite, Right? When we're struggling financially, we're thinking, man, this is not the time for me to do something else. Well, I, I don't even have the money to buy snacks. These are, these are real deals. How many of you know that? This, these are not bad people. These are just real things we fight. A hundred thousand years from now, what will you wish you had done? you will wish you followed what Jesus asked you to do. And so let's do it. Let's do it. And all of you are heroes that fight these ites, and you just do it when it just wasn't the best right now. But you did it because the Lord was calling us to do it. I, I applaud you. But this is what we're called to do. It's the right thing to do. Let's stand together, can we? Praise the Lord. God is calling men and women. There are a lot of ladies God's using today. Hallelujah. 
that are heroes. Yeah. A lot of ladies God's using today, but God's using men and ladies today. Would you stretch your hands up? Jonathan, come to dismiss us. Would you stretch your hands before the Lord? And the first thing I want to ask you to do is would you thank God for not giving up on you? For his grace and his mercy that he's still talking to you and saying, I want you to be a part of my team. I'm, I'm, I want you to be part of the solution to the mess that's happening in the world today. Thank you for speaking, God, to us. Thank you for cleansing us from our sin. Thank you for forgiving us from all disobedience. Oh, thank you, Lord. And in the name of Jesus, Lord, we yield ourselves to you once again. Just say it out loud. Say, Father, I hear you speaking. I know my weaknesses, but I know your strength. So strengthen me by the Holy Spirit to follow you, to fulfill my assignment, to possess my land, in the name of Jesus. If you agree with that, would you say amen? Can we clap in agreement today?